Let's bring Mark Levin to the stage, shall we? Mark Levin.
to meet Richard and Henri in Canada, and I'm thinking back to this young, incredible slam poet I had seen. The film I had was making, Thug Life in D.C., about locking up all these young Afro-Americans. And I said, geez, what if Saul was one of those characters that gets thrown in? And instead of making a musical, we use the slam poetry as kind of the connective tissue. Uh, and his dilemma about what he's going to do and can he use this creativity to somehow navigate his way. And it was on that walk, and I kind of pitched it to my two buddies. Uh, and they looked at me and they said, we're going to make slam. Uh, and so that, that's how it was born. It was made on a credit card. Uh, <laughs> Which you maxed out, or what? I, it wasn't mine. It, oh. was, it was on Reeves, uh, to his credit. Bones and I were in our conference room uh, in the summer of 97, and I was, you know, working on a number of other projects, and on Reeves basically said, I'm begging you. I need to do something. He threw his credit card down on the table. I looked at Bones. Bones looked at me and said, okay, we'll give you two weeks. Uh, and the other miracle, that was part of it was, and watching the film tonight brought it back, getting into DC jail. Okay, I want to ask about this. Well, um, this is a miracle. It is a miracle, and how it happened was, as I said, I did this film, uh, Thug Life in DC. I got to know uh, the warden, Pat Jackson, very well. Uh, but there was a woman above her who ran the Department of Corrections. She was known as Miss Iron Panties, hardcore African-American Republican. And I set up a meeting with her to kind of try to see, is it possible that we could bring some talent down and do something unusual but have access to the jail? And what happened that afternoon, Newt Gingrich, and the Congress was so upset at the District of Columbia for re-electing Marion Barry, who also appears in the film, <laughs> judge, as the judge. Yes. Uh, but they, 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 they were outraged, the Republicans, and they defunded the city of Washington. And it was on C-SPAN as I was sitting in the head of the Department of Corrections, and she was so angry, even though she was a conservative and a hard ass, she was so upset. She looked at me and she said, I'll give you 10 days. Can you do it in 10 days? I said, yes. No talk about insurance, liability, releases. Uh, I mean, I look at it now, and it is amazing, and there's no way, of course, you know, post 9-11, post everything, uh, COVID everything, you know, it would just be impossible. But uh, the realism was real, and the, the final note is that uh, when that fight scene happens with the correction officers and the uh, some of the detainees, I was standing next to Pat Jackson, the warden, and she started jumping up and down, and she goes, making movies is so much fun. <laughs> now, she did get angry at us. I, I, I honestly don't remember what it was, but I felt like I was called to the you know, vice principal's office. Um, literally the morning of the climactic scene in the jail yard, where Saul Williams raped Joshua does the Amethyst Rock poem. And uh, obviously, we, we had, you know, we were going to spend the whole day shooting just that scene. Mm -hmm. I can't remember why she was upset, what we did. They crossed the line, but uh, she said, I'm going to give you 90 minutes to shoot that scene. To shoot that scene. And we had planned the entire day. So that was almost documentary. I mean, the whole movie is obviously documentary yes. style. But that was real in that we didn't know if some of the detainees were going to get pissed off, were getting frustrated, which this movie 
crew doing here? You know, we were working with certain people. Why not us? There was a lot of tension. That was not just acting. There was a tremendous amount of tension in that yard um, when Saul did that uh, explosive performance. Um, How nervous did that make you feel? I, you know, I, I, I it's you hard. Said, it's hard said, to remember. But you sensed it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I, I was, I was afraid for Saul. It's funny. In Thug Life, I'm doing a film now. Well, first of all, the uh, young uh, man who raps the song when he's put in the cell yes. right at the beginning, yes. he's free now. Wow. Uh, he got out. He had three life sentences. Uh, we met him when he was 16. Uh, I think he was 17 when he did that. Uh, but we met him doing Thug Life, and I'm doing a documentary now with his best friend, who is one of the the supporting characters in that documentary. But the reason I bring it up is we were just looking at it uh, recently, you know, to start thinking how to go back and forth in time. And I saw Saul Williams walk through the frame. And I remember we brought Saul down as part of our crew. He had never been in jail. He went to NYU. Uh, he had studied theater. Uh, he had performed Shakespeare. Uh, so, you know, he had no sense of what it was like. and. Uh, as we were talking about this project, he said, you know, maybe I should come down and actually be in the DC jail. So we made him part of our crew. I totally forgot. And here he walks through the frame. He was our, you know, our PA. Um, so yeah, it's... Uh, Tell me how much of this was scripted and how much of it was truly improvised. Uh, Sonia Soane's rap that she does, her, her poetry, who wrote that? Did she write it? She did. That, that was... Uh, that was real. Uh, the, the exchange between uh, Saul's character and Sonia's character in the alleyway, was that scripted? Because that's powerful. Yeah. That is powerful, incredibly powerful. What, what we did is we had a, um, a working outline. Uh, it was almost like a beat sheet. You know? So for a scene like that, you know, we had uh, not rehearsed as much as uh, kind of acted out different approaches to these scenes. So there were certain ideas that they had already played with, like uh, I remember that line, this is no metaphor, this yeah. is my life. That was, that was actually from the first um, rehearsal that uh, Saul and Sonia did together. Uh, and we videotaped those. So uh, they, they developed the language and we had a script that was kind of just hit the beats of kind of what ideas should somehow be integrated into these scenes. And the story, you know, the, the simple story was myself and Richard, uh, you know, Richard, who was one of the producers, Richard Stratton, uh, who plays the uh, prosecutor in the courtroom uh, with Marion Barry as the judge. Richard, of course, was convicted as an international uh, um, hashish and marijuana smuggler uh, and got himself out of prison uh, and uh, so he, he was a, a, a tremendous resource, you know, his own experiences. Uh, so, yeah, we had a, a working outline. We knew, <coughs> you know, kind of where the story was going. Although, again, like meeting Mike, the guy that plays Big Mike. Um, that kind of sub-story came out of a negotiation because we were shooting in the southeast uh, section of Washington, D.C., which at that time was, you know, the murder capital of the United yeah. States. And it was very dangerous. Um, and we had to negotiate with the local gangs, you know, to kind of get permission. Okay. And Richard, you know, that's where Richard really stood up when he talked about his experience. You know, obviously we were white, you know, we were coming down there. Uh, but Richard got up in that meeting that we had in a community center with some of the leaders, and Mike was one of the leaders. And he told us the story about being shot uh, and uh, surviving, uh, which we integrated. And in its way, it's right. Yeah. right. We integrated yeah. into the movie. So it, it was a combination of, I mean, look, the end, I can't say I wrote the end. No, the end. Uh, you know, I mean, the monolith obviously is just a powerful symbol, and yet when uh, 
saw was standing there, their bars on the, uh, yeah. you know, and, and is he inside or is he outside? And, 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 and it's, it's both a spaceship and a wall that goes up forever. Uh, so you find things, again, you couldn't do that now since 9-11, since January 6th, unfortunately. You know, we have to defend our, our national monuments, etc. But that was literally at 1230, a night the crew was totally exhausted, but we drove by, Mark Benjamin, to his credit, the director of photography and I, got out and saw him and said, you know, let's just try something, you know. So it was, we had no idea until with the music, with the, you know, the flow of the story. Uh, so there was, you know, the idea of the, sto the basic uh, outline for a story, but no, a lot of it was improvised and a lot of it happened like, I shot three motherfuckers and I don't know why. That was real. That guy came up with that. He floored us. Wow. I mean, and he was in prison. Yeah, he, that, that whole class. All those was, guys were the only people that we brought down wow. were Saul, Sonia, Bones, who plays Hoffa, uh, Bosio, who plays the Asian American, yeah. uh, and one of the uh, uh, prison guards, wow. uh, Don. Wow. That was it. So we brought five. The rest. And that was part of my deal with uh, the, the director and, and the uh, warden was, let's work with your team. There's talent yeah. here. And Sonia had taught at Rikers Island. And originally, we were going to do this on Rikers Island. That was the original idea, yeah. to do it in New York, do it on Rikers Island. But that was impossible to, uh, you know, to get access to. I just want to ask one question about the soundtrack before sure. we go to the audience. It's great. So you've had a love affair with music. How does this, how did you put this together? What were the influences? Because it wasn't just music, but it was sounds. There were a lot of street sounds. It was quite varied. And I'm curious how you put this together. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, DJ Spooky, I didn't really know that much about him. And you so, worked throughout the entire film, you worked with him? Yes. Saul so, so introduced me to him. Okay. Amir Lewis, who was the editor, also was, was very plugged into music. Uh, so, um, you know, I got to give them tremendous credit. They really kind of helped bring the music. A brand new and I knew that song, you know, uh, that was a theme song for me. Uh, for whatever reason, I just fell in love with that, uh, that, that vibe. Uh, but uh, you're right, the, the, the soundtrack is absolutely key. Just yeah, watching it now, it, it makes such a huge impulsive. difference. Uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, the, it, it was a magic moment. A lot of the people, like you said, Sonia went on to Star in the Wire. Saul, I don't know how many people here know, you know Saul just wrote uh, and produced and uh, directed with his wife a film that is now out theatrically called Neptune's Frost, uh, which is a wild film. Uh, it's described as a Afrofuturist uh, sci-fi musical. <laughs> shot, shot in Rwanda, uh, but is wild. Uh, so he's, I mean, besides him having been a, a, a spoken word artist, poet, uh, musician, um, I remember he told me once he was in Korea, and he showed this film, and the entire audience, yeah, the entire audience knew the words to Amethyst Rock, and recited it during the film. Uh, I, I, I never knew the reach the film had. Uh, he did. He traveled all over the world with the film, and then on his own as, as an artist, um, and now he's, he and his wife have exploded with this incredible film, which I think will be streaming in, in, in a few weeks. Um, Should we go to the audience for questions? Who wants to talk to Mark? I got a question. Go ahead. Did you thank Newt? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I should. You're right. <laughs> yes. Was Tom Hussey Coates part of the slam group and he just happened to be in the crowd? Because I noticed he's in the credits. He, I was looking to see if I could find him. He's in the scene uh, that is at a like, garden party at night uh, when, when uh, Ray gets out and then goes and meets Sonia and she's having a little reception. He was in Georgetown uh, then and uh, he was there. Uh, a good catch. 
Yeah, that is. Who else? Question for Mark. Yes. Yeah, Mark. First Glenn, you found the right chair, and you made it tonight. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you for your directions. Uh, I'm just wondering how you got these performances out of these guys that they weren't actors, and how you got the camera in so tight and was able to just have the thing look so real. Well, first of all, Saul was an actor. You know, uh, I mean, he studied theater. Uh, so, you know, he had chops, although this was like his first movie. Sony was not. Uh, she was a, a poet, a performance artist. Uh, Mark Benjamin, the director of photography, uh, and I had made uh, quite a number of films. And, you know, going back to uh, Lloyd, your original question. In the 90s, we ended up doing a whole bunch of films for HBO. They had a series called America Undercover. So I ended up doing, I don't know, six or seven films in prisons uh, and on the streets. That all really led to this. And Mark was there with me. It started with gang war, banging in Little Rock, uh, execution machine, life on death row, gladiator days, prisoners of the war on drugs. So we had spent a decade both in the streets and in prisons. Um, and the war on drugs was certainly the kind of through line, you know, that this was the front line of this insane war that we were fighting with our own people and destroying our own people. Uh, and Mark, it's interesting, you know, your comment, um, he is a, uh, a director of photography who wants to be right in the middle of the action. Uh, it's just a, his personality. Uh, so I think all that led up to this in a way that we were rehearsing and we were familiarizing ourselves with this world. We were so steeped in it, even as white uh, middle class people, you said Maple. Well, actually, I grew up in Elizabeth originally, which is a little closer to the street. Uh, as a teenager, I lived in Maplewood in suburbia. Uh, and when I showed this film, uh, at, I think at Howard or something, I remember walking on the stage and the, <laughs> the crowd gasped. <laughs> that, that's Mark Levin, <laughs> middle-aged Jewish guy from New York City. Wait a second, this doesn't make sense. So there were no pictures of you beforehand. Nothing. Right. 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 Okay. Right. Exactly. So, uh, so you know, we had spent a good amount of time. I mean, gang war that the, the, the really kicked it all off. You know, we got caught in the middle of a drive-by, uh, and, uh, and 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 you know, that was like a shocker. Uh, and when I met uh, Dr. Dre, and when I met Snoop, and you know, these, these celebrities, but at that time when, I, when we did banging, Gang War Banging in Little Rock in 92, 93, uh, that album, The Chronic, had just come out, and uh, Snoop said, I can't, you know, I can't believe that film. These white kids, boys and girls, singing Bow Wow Wow, Yippee Yo, Yippee Yay. Dr. Dre says to me, goes, you're the one that made that fucking film? I can't believe it. So that, that was the beginning of a decade that really climaxed with Slam. Um, and the performances, I think, in a way, Saul, Sonia, Bo Sia, what ended up on Broadway in, in, in uh, Def Jam Poetry, uh, Bones, Malone ended up in, in two other feature films I made, White Boys in Brooklyn, Babylon. I think they were all, it was one of these kind of harmonic convergences where everybody was at a place, frustrated, yet dreaming of something, you know, bigger, and that we all met at just an incredible moment. Uh, and we were able to talk our way into the DC jail, kind of act out uh, what it is, you know, we wanted to say. I don't think any of us anticipated, uh, I certainly didn't, uh, you know, the reaction uh, at Sundance, uh, even getting into Sundance. I remember when Bones came up to me and goes, where's, where's Sundance? And I said, it's in Utah. He goes, 
are there any black people there? That's a good question. Uh, and the first screening, of course, at Sundance was at 8.30 in the morning. And I was sitting in the back of the house, and the guy next to me was a drunk. I don't know how he got in, and he was snoring the entire time. And I thought, oh, this is how we end up. You know, this is a disaster. So none of us, uh, uh, you know, was thinking we're going to win Sundance, and then we went to Cannon and won the Camera Door, and that was even a bigger shock. Uh, so, uh, but looking back at it, 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 it's explosive, and, and that's not just me. It's these, it's these people in, in their lives, and what, um, and why I really appreciate uh, being here and Lloyd having me here, is that, um, in a way, what I think another thing that's unique is that all of these characters, as they've gone on, none of them wanted to just have a conventional career. They were all artists. They were all independent spirits. They were all, what Sonia says in that class and what she says in that alley about freedom, I mean, I, I, I've taken that to be what the movie really is. Yes, it's about a kid thrown in prison using his wits and his words, you know, to try to liberate himself. But we're all in some kind of box. We're all in some kind of prison, we're all looking to break out and to be more and to become more. Uh, and, to, and to find that, creativity is key. That's the magic key, is creativity. Uh, so I, I, I think it just happened. It was those 10 years of, of work inside the belly of the beast, on the streets and in these jails and prisons, and meeting the right group of people that all gelled for really only two and a half weeks, or maybe it was you know three in the end. But I mean, it was really a short amount of time. Okay, the ten days. Is that what she said? Your ten days. Yes, something like that. So anyway, uh, I think uh, we're going to take one more question, then we're going to wrap up. Go ahead. Yeah. You know, as you said, you're a white kid from New Jersey. How? Did this start at school, and did you enter the theater? How did you get to where you are now? Right, well that's a Lloyd's question. Uh, Wesleyan was somewhere in between, but I couldn't stick around there long. Uh, I, I did drop out of Wesleyan, uh, and then go back and drop out again. Uh, I think, I mean, first of all, my parents, my parents were, were uh, labor organizers and civil rights activists. I, I, I as a kid, you know, a young kid, I was at the March on Washington uh, and when Martin Luther King gave his famous speech. Uh, so I grew up in a household, you know, where my parents, uh, you know, had a tremendous influence on me. Uh, but career-wise, I, ha I have to admit that it was not a plan. Uh, in fact, when uh, Sheila Nevins, who's the famous uh, diva of uh, documentaries from HBO, said, you know, you should go down to Little Rock and do uh, something on the gang scene. I, 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 I kind of backed off. I was like, oh, they already made that movie Color. Sean Penn was in it. What's new to say about gangs? And, you know, who wants to go down to Little Rock in the middle of the summer when it's 110 degrees every day? And she said, you know, well, you'll come up with your own angle. Uh, so I, I was not, it wasn't conscious. In other words, as, a, as kind of a game plan or as this is the world I'm going to explore or somehow I feel comfortable in or, or, or you know, um, it happened. Uh, but I think my, my background, I, I often joke also, you know, I was born in New York City and I, I, I rode the subways, you know, when I was six months old, seven months old, no telling how that will scramble your brain. Uh, <laughs> and uh, as you look around, um, I want to talk about your dad, who was your colleague. Yeah, my dad, well, well, my dad and my mom. My mom worked uh, in the juvenile justice system. Uh, at the end of her life, I had not, I dedicated this film to my mom, uh, who passed away uh, a few months before we won uh, Sundance. And my dad was an, uh, you know, an unbelievable uh, journalist. He became a filmmaker. We worked together. Uh, and. Uh, but in many ways, it was more my mom who worked with young, at-risk youth. 
that was a good part of, uh, she was a, a psychotherapist, uh, a psychologist. Uh, but I think, in the end, you know, when I was joking about Elizabeth, I did grow up, my sister and I, who both ended up uh, living in New York City, my sister Nicole is only a year younger than me, and then I have two younger sisters who both ended up living in the suburbs. And I really do think growing up in Elizabeth, New Jersey, when my parents were labor organizers, uh, where we lived in a working class Italian American neighborhood, uh, you know, where people went to jail, the neighbors, you know, oh, he's in, Bobby's in jail again. And, uh, just growing up on the street in that uh, kind of world, it had a profound influence on me and my, my sister. My two younger sisters, who grew up more in Maplewood, I was a teenager when I arrived in Maplewood. In fact, um, I arrived <laughs> with a leather jacket slung over my shoulder, my hair greased back, and I remember walking into sixth grade, and I'd never seen so many blondes in my life. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Uh, but so I, I was an adolescent uh, in, in suburbia. But uh, I grew up in a working class where my parents where my father worked uh, for the, the uh, railroad as a mechanic because he was a labor organizer, and my mother worked in Westinghouse in a radio factory because she was an organizer. And so I didn't realize it, but you know, they used to have the activists come together, the radicals come together, it was interracial. Uh, and uh, that energy, uh, I think, uh, you know, had a profound impact on me in some way of finding a, a comfort level. As I get, I say again, it wasn't that I targeted it. Uh, when I was in Little Rock, I did, we started gang war banging in Little Rock. I remember, you know, one of the things that, uh, that kind of protected me was that people thought I was an undercover cop. <laughs> so, you know, they, they, they were very careful, you know, like, like well, what, you went to that park? No, nobody goes to that park, you know, you get shot in that park, but I didn't even know. Uh, but also, finally, I would just say that there's the human curiosity of, uh, I work with Bill Moyers, uh, I know tomorrow I'm going to go to a film that Kathy Hughes, uh, with her, Ellen and I ran into her on the street coming over here, and I know her from the Moyers Day. And the thing about Bill Moyers uh, that really also had a, a profound impact on me is his first book was Listening to America. He listened. And that sounds so simple. Uh, yet, it is incredibly powerful. People want to be heard. People want to be respected. People want to think their stories mean something. And, uh, I am curious, that's just a, a, a natural either asset or defect, <laughs> but I'm curious uh, and I think that went a long way, you know, in listening to people's stories, even on death row in Texas, in Huntsville, uh, and being amazed by what human beings are capable of and where you can find talent and where you can find hope in places that you might never imagine you could. Uh, so, you know. Can we get a round of applause? Yeah. 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 Now, before you go, before you go, uh, I do want to talk about where Mark will be tomorrow. Right back here at 2 o'clock, we're going to screen a very recent documentary that he did called I Promise which he directed and co-produced with LeBron James. And this is the story of the I Promise School that LeBron funded and opened in Akron, his hometown. And Mark basically covers the first year of that school. And you're going to see, is at the level that Mark gets in, you're going to see children, perhaps, as you typically don't see them, and their struggles coming from hard places in Akron and requiring so much love and so much attention and so much support and what happens as a result of that. It's a fantastic documentary, and I'm not saying it because it's a friend of 52 years. It is a gorgeous documentary, and I urge you to come at 2 o'clock tomorrow. We'll have another Q&A uh, about that film and some of his you know, key documentary work. So we have a party going on right now uh, at the Stone Mill, which is at the base of, of Mill Street in that big, great building. 
It looks like it has cleared up outside. So there is food, Thai food from Sabai Sabai, and there are drinks. Uh, so we urge you to go down and enjoy yourselves. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. We have a special evening tonight. Thank you for being